this morning we'll be looking both at the Gospel and the Epistle appointed for this 12th Sunday after Pentecost. We'll address the Gospel first. The Gospel comes to us from St. Matthew, the 16th chapter, beginning with the 21st verse. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Our reading today includes the decidedly perplexing and somewhat, at least I think, heartbreaking moment where Peter decides to attempt to forbid Jesus to go to Jerusalem. And Jesus calls him a Satan, an accuser, literally. Get behind me, for you do not have in mind the things of God, but rather the things of men. The fact that this bit of unpleasantness took place but a few verses after Peter's most excellent confession of Jesus as the Son of the living God, it perhaps shows us in no uncertain terms that all of us can be within the same life, if not in fact the same day, saints and sinners, angels or devils. Please note that Jesus did not tell Peter to get lost forever. He did not say, you cannot be my disciple or my friend. Instead, Jesus goes on to teach the disciples why he must go to Jerusalem, why his mission must include suffering and death. And that brings us to the heart of today's message. Perhaps even more disturbing than Jesus calling his friend Peter as Satan is Jesus' statement that in order to find our life, we must lose it. But if we seek to preserve our life, we will surely lose it. Beyond the fact that in a world beset by constant discussions of who has lost their life or who will shortly be losing their life, perhaps the last thing we want to discuss is voluntarily losing our lives. Beyond that fact is the simple matter that the statement is inherently perplexing. What does this really mean, to lose our life so that we may find it? Or what may be the more frightening corollary, to preserve our life, to hold fast to it, will in fact be to lose it. In order to understand this text, I'd like to incorporate a technique that I often use in scripture study, that is to look at the text from three different perspectives. Specifically, first look at the text from its historical perspective. To whom is the text addressed? What are the historical circumstances surrounding the text? What is the context of this particular writing? For as one of my favorite theologians likes to say, the text without a context is just a con. The second perspective from which I like to view a text, particularly if it is a gospel text, is that which I call the Christological perspective. For after all, the Gospels are the good news about Jesus. While the Gospels are peopled with all kinds of characters, the story is really about Jesus. So I ask, what is this text saying about Jesus? 
Finally, I like to look at what I sometimes call the atemporal perspective. That is to say, the perspective from outside of time, or practically speaking, the perspective that may apply to any time. I sometimes also call that the personal or individual perspective. In short, what does this text mean to us who are living millennia later? Let's look first at the historical perspective. When Jesus says this to his disciples, to lose your life is to find it, yet to secure your life will be to lose it. It is at a time of great dialectic tension for Jesus and his band of followers. Up until now, things have been going quite well. They are, it seems, famous, and for the most part, the populace speaks well of them. Sure, they have their problems with the religious establishment, but then, the way things are going, it seems that in short order, they could become the new religious establishment. In short, they have a very nice life in many ways, and Jesus is preparing them for the fact that things are about to change. They will effectively lose hold of the top of the world they think they are on in not too much longer. Instead, they will soon feel as if they are losing everything they have come to hold dear. And that is as it must be. For the real purpose, the real mission, the real life that Jesus came to lead, and the life that Jesus is calling them all towards, that cannot come about until the old life is relinquished. If they never relinquish the old life, the new one will never happen. They will, in the end, lose out on the purpose that has been established for them. That kind of thinking may be particularly poignant when we realize that each of the disciples would eventually lose his life for the sake of gospel from an earthly perspective. Each, that is, except Judas, who in a way sought to hold on to what he knew, the world of transaction commerce, of parsimonious trading. A man's life? What's that worth? Thirty pieces of silver? And in the end, the end that is for Judas, even the money he craved so much held no interest for him. He wound up throwing it back into the temple, and ultimately, he had no interest in living life without the one who first suggested that he needed to lose his life. We turn next to the Christological interpretation. Perhaps this will seem obvious once I begin to explain it, but the one who loses his life to gain it is Jesus. Jesus, at this space and time, understands that he must die an earthly death must succumb to the powers of governmental and religious violence, must walk into that moment that every human being has feared since we first realized we were self-aware. Jesus must overcome not only all the hatred mankind can muster, but he must also overcome death itself. And there would have been no way to do that if the cup had passed from him. No way to break the cycle of violence with a prayer for forgiveness. No way to tell the world that death is but an illusion, an ugly, frightening, misery-inducing illusion, but an illusion nonetheless. Jesus needed to lose his life in order to find the larger, boundless life, to become, as Paul writes, the firstborn from the dead, paving for us the way that each of us will tread, the way that leads not to the final loss of the grave, but rather to life that is more real even than what the most blessed of us can now perceive. And right now I'm remembering a brother in Christ who liked to critique my writing and teaching by saying words to the effect of, well, that's all very theological and intellectual. But I want to know, what does that mean for me? And that would bring us to the third perspective. 
And of course, that brings us back to the beginning. What does this say to us? Now, there was a time when I was younger when it seemed that the world was a little younger, too. When I could fairly plausibly preach this text with a statement that said something like, well, in today's day and age, fortunately not too many people are having to physically lay down their lives for the sake of what they believe. But of course, if we follow the news, that seems less and less realistic, doesn't it? It seems we are moving into a time when increasingly some have found themselves needing to lose their lives. And that may be the simplest and most direct application of this verse from the personal or atemporal perspective. There are parts of the world where people are, perhaps more than ever in recent times, losing their lives over belief in Christ. Now, I could try to issue some sort of church-approved comfort by suggesting that when the bullets or bombs have done their work, or the axe has completed its brief arc, those who have lost their lives will awaken to what one hymn poetically describes as that more glorious day. But in a way, unless their reality, their experience, is actually ours, to linger too long in that place would be to divert the text away from ourselves. Still, most of us are not facing an executioner's axe because we have found ourselves with the wrong religion, or lack thereof, in the wrong place, in the wrong time. Although, as I believe you will see shortly, our situation may not be as disconnected from those who live and die in extremis, as we would like to imagine or hope. So to understand how we are to lose our lives in order to gain life, we must first understand what it is we mean when we say the word life. Yes, of course, there's the way we might learn to define life in a biology class. To breathe, to have a beating heart, to have senses that work, to have active brain function. Yes, those are the indicators of life. Or are they? Years ago, during an energy crunch, when we were all told to keep our winter thermostats down to 68 degrees, a man I knew said, I won't do that. I won't come home to a cold house sitting there at 68 degrees. That's not living. Another fellow I knew, a man who was in the United States on a work visa from Russia, Russia, that is, when capitalism was first taking hold again in what had been the Soviet Union, complained about what he considered restrictive American culture with its abundance of regulations and laws. The law, he told me, says how you can do business, what you can charge how fast you can drive, and sometimes even what color you can paint your house. And I say, that's not living. An elderly woman I knew many years ago was having trouble with a house that she and her husband lived in. They could no longer maintain it on their own, and they were unwilling to hire any help. The situation was rapidly becoming unsafe. I gently suggested that they needed to move to some place where Maintenance was not so much of an issue. An apartment, perhaps. An apartment, the woman scoffed. I could never live in an apartment. That's far too restrictive. That's not really living. Once we had all gathered to celebrate. The celebration was costly, more than any of us could pay for. But then we weren't paying for it. Just enjoying. Expensive food and more expensive wine and sumptuous surroundings. Now this is really living, my friend leaned over to me and said, between bites of a dinner, that I'm sure cost more than I make in a week. We all have, and I believe rightfully so, a sense that living is more than just being alive in a medical sense. And if we examine ourselves and our culture, we will discover that in order to count, 
Our lives must contain certain things. Health, for one thing. Youth, for another. And then the appearance of youth, when youth is gone. And then the illusion of youth, when the appearance of youth is no longer plausible. And then, of course, there's stuff. What is life without stuff? Of course, we have to have a place to live and to which to put all that stuff. And the list goes on. Of course, I could be less materialistic and suggest that family from friends, someone by whom we may be loved and whom we can love, perhaps those should be at the top of the list. Although, to be blunt, as I examine myself and the world in which we live, it does seem as if more often we love things and use people rather than the other way around. But our lives also consist of something else as well. Our lives consist of the need to hold on to what we cherish, the desire to protect and preserve what we've got, or else they consist of the need and the drive to get what we want but don't have. And it seems we've now stumbled upon the source of misery, haven't we? We fight entire wars to protect what we believe is ours, or else to take what we think should be ours. If you try to take from me, I will defend what is mine, with the law if possible, and with my fists or weapons if need be. And that's only just so we are taught. We have rights, and we must defend them. Now, this is a difficult teaching. It's hard, and it's not something many can embrace all at once. Yet, it is exactly that sort of life that Jesus is calling us to lose. The life that says, I will hold on to this because it is mine. I will take what I believe I have a right to. I will retaliate if you impugn my rights or my dignity. I will lash out at you if you act or appear in a way that offends me. If you believe the wrong thing, wear the wrong clothes, support the wrong political party, go to bed with the wrong gender, I have a right to put you in your place because I am only protecting my way of life. Listen now to our epistle text. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Now, so far, that's not so bad, is it? Not exactly easy all the time, but certainly a worthy goal. Then comes the hard part, the losing of our life, the relinquishing of everything we think is dear to us, a way of life, if we listen, so opposite to everything we have been taught. The text continues, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be prideful, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, in so far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What's interesting here, brothers and sisters, is that the life you gain is not something you get because you have given up the old life. It is instead something you gain as you are relinquishing the old.
The very act of dissembling the old life, the life of me-first-isms, ushers you into a new life. The new life we are, stone by living stone, constructing the kingdom of God. I'm going to end with a story that's been making its way around the internet. It's a parable of sorts that originated with Christian author and blogger Brian McLaren. The story goes like this. Please debaptize me, the woman said. The priest's face crumpled. My parents tell me that you were the one who did it, she said. But I was not consulted, so I want you to undo it right now. The priest's eyes asked why. You know, said the woman, if it were just about belonging to this religion and being forgiven, then I would stay. If it were just about believing this list of doctrines and upholding this particular list of rituals, I'd be okay with that. But this last Sunday's sermon made it clear it's about more, way more than I bargained for. So please, debaptize me. The priest looked down and said nothing. She continued, You said that baptism sends me into the world to love enemies. I don't, nor do I plan to. You said it means being willing to stand against the flow, but I like the flow. You described it like rethinking everything like joining some kind of a movement. But I'm not rethinking or moving anywhere. So unbaptize me, please. The priest began to weep. Soon great sobs rose from his deepest heart. He took off his glasses, blew his nose, took three tissues to dry his eyes. The woman looked at him quizzically. These are tears of joy, he said. I think you are the first person who ever truly listened or understood. Fine, said the woman. So will you please unbaptize me? The first person who truly understood. But we understand, don't we? Uh, let us move towards the new life to which Christ is calling us by losing the old life of anger, hatred, revenge, prejudice, and selfishness. Uh, let us pray that we may walk in the works which he has prepared for us as we journey towards oneness with him and the Father and the whole human family. Mm -hmm.